Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinkers series proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I am pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled Making Stars and Planets. In this talk, Chris Mihos, Professor and Chair of Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University and a Fellow of the Institute for the Science of Origins, will tell you how stars and planets form from clouds of dust and gas collapsing under the influence of gravity. Please enjoy the talk. Last time we talked about going from the quantum structure uh, down to actually making uh, galaxies and galaxy clusters, but we skipped a step, which is how do the galaxies make the stars that we see, right? When we look at the galaxies, what we're seeing is stars. So how do we do that step? And then ultimately, how do we make the planets that we live on, or the planet that we live on? So we'll start with star formation. And I mean, remember what a star is. It's just a big ball of gas that's very hot and very dense, and so deep in its core, it's undergoing nuclear reactions, it's fusing hydrogen into helium. And so if a big ball of gas is what we're gonna make, we better start with, as our raw ingredients, an even bigger ball of gas. So these are interstellar clouds of gas and dust. They're, they're very large, um, and what you see there at the center um, is a number of young stars that are lighting up the, this gas and intermixed with this gas, which is mostly hydrogen, some helium, and a very little bit of heavier elements, things like carbon, oxygen, magnesium, iron. Um, mixed throughout these, these clouds of interstellar gas is actual dust clouds, right? So those dark things you're seeing in there, that's where the dust is so thick it actually blocks your view of the, of the cloud. And these clouds can get fairly dense Here's a denser uh, a cloud known as the Horsehead Nebula. What you're actually seeing is, uh, try and think three dimensions. In the background, there's a giant gas cloud, which is sort of glowing a red, and then in front of it is a very thick, dense cloud of gas and dust, and it's so dense that it's blocking your view of the, the red gla gas cloud behind it. But this is known as the Horsehead Nebula, and these are the kinds of clouds that exist in, in uh, interstellar space. So let's think about what we want to do. We want to take those big gas clouds and collapse them down, make them small and dense to make stars. And gravity's working in our favor here. Gravity wants to take those clouds and pull them together. And the higher the density, we talked about this a little bit last time, the higher the density, the faster and easier it is for the cloud to collapse under its own weight. But the cloud also has something pushing out, and that's what we call thermal pressure. In other words, the gas has a temperature, and that temperature causes the gas cloud to want to expand. Just like if we had a balloon of gas and we heated it up, the balloon would expand a little bit. That's because that thermal pressure is pushing the balloon walls out. The same sort of thing happens with this gas cloud. If it's got a high enough temperature, it's gonna to wanna to expand and fight against gravity pulling it together. And so what that means is we've got a battle on our hands, and if we want to make stars, if we want the thing to collapse, we've got to have gravity win. And so the place to look for star formation in these gas clouds is the clouds that are the densest and the coldest. So here's an example of one of those clouds. This is a cloud in the uh, M16, what, what's called the Eagle Nebula, and this is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And again, you, the picture you want to have is the background is sort of a, a, a larger cloud of gas which is glowing a greenish color, and then in front of it is this very dense cloud of gas and dust, and it's actually in these little nodules where the individual stars are forming. So this cloud is not gonna make one star, it's gonna make many stars. Right? It's much bigger than, than a star. So, you know, I, I, I gave you that picture of, of a nice spherical cloud collapsing, but of course, real gas clouds don't look like that. 
They look like the one I just showed you, much more massive, many thousands or even tens of thousands of times the mass of our own sun. And they're not nice, smooth, round gas clouds. They have lumps and bumps in them, a lot of structure, little high density pockets. Um, and so what that means is when you think of a collapsing gas cloud, a big one, what happens is the little lumps inside of it collapse down first into small things, right? And then the whole thing, as it collapses down, you get more of these little fragments. We call it fragmentation, these little pockets of, of gas that start to collapse. So this is a simulation to give you a feel for this effect. This is a simulation of what happens when you have a gas cloud try to collapse under its own gravity. And you can see the outer regions, they're very tenuous and so the heat is sort of making them expand. But in the inner regions where they're denser, they're starting to collapse. And you can see that many different areas are collapsing all at once. So the color coding is just sort of showing you gas density. So the yellow is the densest parts. And as we stop here, you can see multiple areas where it's dense. And we'll zoom in and let the cloud go a little bit slower now. And what you're gonna to start to see is, there's one, in this simulation, when the density gets high enough and the temperature cold enough, you can make individual stars. And that's what those little white dots are. Those are representing stars that are made out of this cloud. And so this one cloud is not making one star, it's making many, many stars. They're densest in those dense inner regions, but you can see many of the stars are actually getting flung out of the star forming region. And so at the end, you have a young cluster of stars with lots and lots of stars in the center, but stars also that are sort of expelled out into the interstellar uh, environment. So this is how we think star formation happens. It doesn't happen one by one, it happens in this cluster-like environment. So that sort of gives you this three-dimensional view of, of the cloud. So does that, you know, it's always important when you do these simulations, right? How, how do we know we're actually simulating real things? So this is a, a double image of the Orion Nebula, which you can actually see from, from Cleveland, on, on maybe not quite from downtown with the sky so bright, but in the suburbs. If you look at Orion's belt, the middle star hanging down from Orion's belt, the middle star in the dagger, is actually not a star, it's this nebula. So it's a birthplace of stars. And here on the right, it's what it looks like in optical, in other words, in normal light. And you see the glowing gases that the stars are forming from. But again, the, it mixed in with this gas is a lot of dust, and that makes it hard to see all the way into this cloud to see where all the stars are forming. But as I mentioned last time, infrared light actually penetrates dust, so we can look deep inside the cloud if we look in the infrared. And that's what's shown on the left. This is an image not from, from Hubble Space Telescope, but from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is the infrared space telescope. And what you see, I hope you can see, is that here is the center of the cloud where all the stars are forming, but you can see all these little green, greenish dots here. Those are the young stars that are forming that are hidden in this image by the dust clouds in front of us. And to me, it's very striking how much this Spitzer image on the left looks like that simulation. So we really have, you know, we have some understanding that this, this indeed is how stars start to form. So you have the entire cloud collapsing down and forming individual stars. Let's, let's sort of focus in on what's gonna happen with the individual stars that are forming. So, so now I'm zooming in conceptually on one of the stars that's forming. It's, it's collapsing down. And remember what we talked about, the concept of conservation of angular momentum. That as things that are spinning, as they collapse down, they spin faster and faster. Right? So what happens is for, for an individual star that's forming, as it spins, as it collapses down, it starts to rotate faster and faster. And the central regions keep getting denser and denser, but the outer regions actually, rather than collapsing right to the center, flatten out into a disk. We call these the protostellar disks. And what you're seeing here, these are images from the Hubble Space Telescope of individual stars that are forming in the Orion cloud. 
the, the again, backlight, the bluish greenish is the cloud as a whole. And what you're seeing is these dusty circles, these dark circles, those are the disks. They're so dense that the dust blocks the light behind them. So they look like little dark disks. And then in the very center, you see the young forming star. So we're starting to get down to very high densities in the center. And because of that collapse, because the, the gravity is, is making the cloud collapse, the temperatures of that protostar are getting higher and higher. So it's starting to glow. But ultimately, even though it's shining from that energy of collapse, it's not yet a star. Because what defines a star is when it's driving nuclear reactions in its core. So once that star has collapsed, that protostar has collapsed down far enough that the central temperature gets out to about 10 million degrees, that's the temperature at which nuclear fusion can start. And you start turning hydrogen into helium in the core, and that nuclear process liberates energy, and that's what makes a star shine. So what you're seeing here, this is actually a, uh, a protostar known as T tauri, and it's the star right at the center of that dense dust cloud. We think we're catching this. This is not yet a star. We think we're catching this just before nuclear fusion starts. So in you know, a few million years, this is gonna be a bona fide star. Right now, it's still a protostar. So once that star forms, then all the energy of the, the nuclear fusion comes out of the star and heats up the gas around it and causes it to glow, and that's what's driving this effect. That you're seeing the gas cloud here around these stars in the core that are, that's being he heated up by the star formation in the young stars and is glowing. And it, if you wait long enough, all that energy that's coming out of the star will eventually just push the cloud away. It'll disperse all that gas, and you'll end up with a cluster of stars. This is the Pleiades cluster, again, another astronomical object that you can see from Cleveland. It's a little bit early yet, but come December and January, it'll be overhead. This is, uh, you may know it as the Seven Sisters, the constellation of the Seven Sisters. There are actually in this, sorry, the, the star cluster of the Seven Sisters, there are actually thousands of stars in this cluster. The, se the ones we know as the Seven Sisters are just the brightest ones. So, I told you how stars form, but, but why, right? What is it that started that, that collapse to form stars? We get clues by looking at galaxies, from pulling away from individual stars and looking at galaxies as a whole. This is the uh, central part of the Whirlpool galaxy. And what you see is the, the little red spots, that's where the young stars have heated up the gas and it's, it's glowing red. And so that's showing you where stars are forming. But really, where stars are going to form, that's in the dense, dark, dusty regions. And they follow these spiral patterns. And what we think is happening is either as the dust clouds, or the gas and dust clouds run into this spiral arm, they sort of get squeezed and compressed because the density is higher there. So you have something moving in and it's ramming into things that are already in there and squeezing it, and that squeezing starts the collapse. That's, that's one possibility. Another possibility is just since there's more stuff in those spiral arms, the density of material is higher, as the, star, as the gas cloud moves in, the, the increased density just causes, you have more gravity, and so it starts to collapse just because it's moved into the spiral arm. And then the, the last thing that people talk about is maybe it's a chain reaction event. That when you form a star or a group of stars, some of them when they get old and die, which very massive stars, that can happen quickly, 10 million years. That's quick to an astronomer. But when they die, they can explode in a supernova and that the energy from that supernova can move out like a blast wave and squeeze gas and cause it to start to collapse. So there are any number of ways this could happen in the way that we're seeing, and I just love this image. This is uh, the nearby galaxy M83, and here you can very clearly see this progression where 
that you have the dust clouds here where we think the beginnings of star formation are happening. And then as you move out along the spiral arm here, you're seeing the older, the slightly older star formation events where the stars have turned on and have heated up the gas. And then out here, this is where the gas has been dispersed and you're seeing the individual stars. So you're seeing the whole pattern of star formation across this spiral arm in, in this nearby galaxy. And we think the same thing happens in our own galaxy. Our own galaxy is a spiral galaxy. We, have, we see clear spiral arms, we see young stars in these spiral arms. So this pattern that we see in other galaxies is happening again in our own. So this is the process of going from individual giant clouds of gas down to these clusters of stars and eventually to stars like our own sun. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching Dr. Chris Mihos of Case Western Reserve University discussing the evolution of stars and planets. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of his talk, Dr. Mihos looked at how gravity makes clusters of stars out of interstellar gas clouds. In the second part, Dr. Mihos will discuss how the planets of our solar system emerged out of the gas and dust that was left over when the sun formed. Please enjoy the talk. Let's switch now and say, all right, once we've got a star, how are we going to form the planets? And let's start by talking about forming our own solar system. That's the planet system that we know the best. So, there's a lot of words here, but what I want to get across is, remember those disks that were forming around the stars? There are a couple important things to keep in mind. Those protoplanetary disks now, they were protostellar disks when we were forming the star, now we've got the star in place, they're gonna grow up into be planets, so it's a protoplanetary disk. The density of stuff near the star is very high, and because it's near the star, the temperature of, this, of that stuff is very high. So as you move outwards, the density drops and the temperature drops. The other thing to remember is what they're made of. Again, like everything in the universe, mostly helium, oh, sorry, excuse me, mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and then trace amounts of these other uh, heavier elements, carbon, oxygen, that stuff. So that's our ingredients, just like it was the ingredients for the star, this is our ingredients for the planets. But planets look very different from stars. Planets aren't big balls of gas. So how do we get to planets from, from this kind of a situation? We start with, I mean, this is sort of a cookbook for making planets, and we're gonna start with something called condensation, which is, in astronomy terms, it's just taking a gas and having solid things condense out of that gas. Now, you're used to that, in a way, here on Earth, right? Clouds of up in, up in the atmosphere, things condense out of those clouds, it's rain, right? You're having, you're having a liquid condensing out of the, the gas. In space, you can't have the liquid form, the density of, of material is too low, but what you can have is solid grains, very microscopic grains start to condense out of the, that gas. And the critical thing is, what kind of grains are there? So, let me walk you through what's going on in the, in the nebula. This is a plot of the temperature on the, on the vertical axis, how hot the nebula is, as a function of how far away from the sun it is. And you can see it's very hot in the center, goes cool as you go to the outskirts. And what I've sketched on there, that's where Mercury lives. Mercury is living at very high temperatures, and in the protoplanetary disk, at those high temperatures, the only solids that could exist are metals, right? Think about other kinds of solids, things like, like ice. Right, ice certainly isn't gonna exist at 2,000 degrees. So the only thing that can exist as a solid at that high temperature is metal, and that's very rare. Most of the disk, like I said, hydrogen, some helium, very little metal. But that's all that could form there. As I start to move outwards, here's where Earth's position in the, in the nebula is. It's cooler, and there, not only do you get metals forming, but you can get what we call silicates, rocks, right? So rocky material, it's, it's cool enough that rocky material can form, but at a little over 1,000 degrees, it still can't make ice, right? Ice is, would, would be a vapor at that temperature. If we keep stepping out, 
eventually we're gonna get a point where the temperature of the nebula drops below what we call the freezing point. And so further out in the nebula, you can start to have ices condense. And to an astronomer, there are lots of different kind of ices. We think of water ice. There's also methane and ammonia. What these are, these are very simple compounds where you have, in the case of water, an oxygen atom with two hydrogen atoms, right, H2O. With methane, it's carbon and two hydrogen. Oh, sorry, four hydrogen. And with um, ammonia, it's, it's um, nitrogen, thank you, nitrogen and four. Sorry, I'm, I'm failing my chemistry twist here. The point is these are simple elements with lots of hydrogen attached to them. And since hydrogen is the most abundant thing in the nebula, you can make lots of those. So once you get out past that freezing point, astronomers call it the snow line in the nebula, all of a sudden you have lots of stuff that can condense out. And so out where Jupiter forms, the, the material that's condensing out of the nebula is much bigger. There's much more stuff to, to make planets out of. And if we go on Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they have lots of, lots of material to, to work with. So this is the condensation point. In the inner regions, we're dealing with metallic substance, rocky material. Once we get to the outer solar system, then we're talking about ices. All right, what's the next step? We, we sort of accreted, we're, we're putting together little grains. What's the next step? The next step is what we call accretion. These little grains start sticking together to make bigger and bigger things. At first, it's not, it's not uh, uh, gravity pulling things together, but it's actually electrostatic forces. So, so think about dust bunnies under your bed, the electrostatic forces that, that, that uh, hold them together, the same thing's happening in the solar system, that these little grains are starting to clump together. And then they're moving around and they might run into another one and then those two will clump together to make a bigger grain. And this will continue to happen until those grains start becoming bigger and bigger objects, planetesimals. So here's sort of a, a conce artist's conception of what the early solar system looked like. And you can see all these little rocky chunks have started to accrete together. And way in the background here, you see a bigger object, a planetesimal. At that point, once you get something that's a fair size, a fair size of a real planet, then its gravity takes over, and now it can start accreting even more material. Its, its gravitational field accelerates the process. And so it starts to win. And once it starts to win and get bigger, it starts to win even more. So this runaway process where very quickly these little grains clump together to form planetesimals. And those planetesimals accrete to form even bigger planetesimals. Out in the outskirts of the solar system, a similar thing is happening, but you have the ices there. There's much more abundant, so there's a lot more of them, so they grow even faster. And out there, because they have so much mass in them, in these planetesimals, their gravity holds not just other planetesimals, but it, the gravity can actually hold the gas around them. Right? So that hydrogen gas suddenly is gravitationally trapped around those planetesimals. And this is how we think planets like Jupiter and Saturn formed. These are mostly, they have a, a dense core of ice, but around them is a giant atmosphere, mostly of hydrogen. So this picture of, of forming the, the planets, at, at some point we're gonna start to have bigger and bigger planetesimals. And oh, excuse me, yeah, so this explains the the planet patterns in the solar system. The inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, it was too hot in that part of the solar system to form these ices. So really, the only thing we could make planets out was the very rare metals and rocky material. And so the inner planets are small and rocky. And then as we move out beyond the, the snow line, which happens between Mars and Jupiter, then all of a sudden we can make these big gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, and, and the ice giants of Uranus and Neptune. So let's go back to this picture of the inner solar system and the planetesimals forming. At some point, you're left with only a few planetesimals 
at this point they've grown up to be proto planets in their own right. And in the late stages of the process, you can get massive collisions. So this is a representation of something we think happened in the Earth's early history. The Earth is the bigger object, and a smaller, sort of a Mars-sized proto-planet hit it. Right? We see these signatures of, of collisions in a number of the planets. In the Earth's case, what we think happened was the, the force and the violence of that collision heated the surface of the Earth and threw a lot of this molten rock out into space. It didn't get out of Earth's gravitational field, so it still sort of orbited the Earth. And over time, it coalesced and formed this object we know, the moon. Right? So the moon, we think, is, a, is a, uh, an object which was created in the last stages of the solar system's formation from one of these giant impacts. And now on the surface of the moon, you can see the last few, uh, 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 the, the last period of bombardment in the solar system when lots of material was, was striking the moon. Right. So that's part two of forming the solar system is, is accretion, giving the outer planets the ability to grow big and trap these giant atmospheres. The inner planets, that were rocky, less of an atmosphere, um, but we see the, the scarring that comes from the, the impacts. So, step three, cleanup. Right? Anytime you're doing a recipe, you have to have a cleanup phase. This is the phase that my daughters are not the best at. So, but the sun was, right? So, so how do we get, I mean, after this process is over, there's still lots of gas and dust lying around and lots, lots of these icy, smaller planetesimals that never grew up to be big planets. So how do we get rid of those things to make the solar system we see today? Well, the first stage is what's called the solar wind. So this is a picture of the sun, and what you're seeing coming out from it is our flares. These are streams of energetic particles, protons, neutrons, atomic nuclei, that are streaming off the sun. And in the early uh, stage of the sun's lifetime, we think this solar wind, this stream of particles, was even stronger than it is today, much stronger than it is today. So the sun is blowing out all these particles, and what they do is they sweep up whatever gas is left over and sweep it out of the solar system, right? So the sun basically blows everybody out. And what you're left with then is solar system without gas, but it still has lots of little leftover chunks in it. Those leftover chunks in the inner solar system are rocky things, they're asteroids. In the outer solar system, they're icy things. They're the things that are gonna be the comets that we see today. But there's a special way we get the comets taken care of, and that is through the giant planets. So look at the, look at the top panel. What that's showing you is a distribution of uh, uh, comet bodies in the current solar system called the Kuiper Belt. These are the little chunks of ice way out beyond the orbit of Neptune, which never really were able to grow up to be planets. They're still out there, they're small, and every once in a while, the gravitational forces of the planets can nudge one of them to come into the inner solar system and we see it as a, what we call a short period comet. So Halley's Comet, for example, is one of these comets. But there was a lot of stuff not just out beyond the orbit of Neptune, there was a lot of these icy bodies that were sort of where Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune were. And they would have liked to have stayed in the solar system too, just orbiting around like the Kuiper Belt objects do. But what happens is the gravitational force from Jupiter and Saturn, these are very massive planets, they actually slingshot these orbiting bodies, these orbiting ice chunks, way out in the solar system, and they slingshot them in sort of every which way. There's no sort of pattern of where they get thrown. And so they end up being spread out almost as far as halfway to the next star. Still, still attached to the, the 
the sun in the sense that the sun's gravity still holds them around. But these are comets that eventually will come back into the inner solar system and then go back out again. And we see these as the long period comets because it takes so long for them to orbit from the outer. That's what this the sort of the spherical cutout is trying to show you is that around the solar system there's this very spherical, spheroidal shell of long period comets. And because they take so long to orbit in and out, when we see it once, we won't see it again for hundreds of thousands of years. So they're one time objects for us. Things like Halley's Comet, which come in regularly, those come from the Kuiper Belt, and those we see sort of on long periods. But these are visitors, when they come in, they're visitors that we only get one shot at. And so they sort of hold the record of what the early solar system looked like when they come in. So that's the cleanup. The sun blows out the gas. The giant planets slingshot the, the, uh, the comets out of the inner solar, or out of the uh, solar system and into the, the Oort cloud. And we're left finally with the solar system that we see today. You've been discussing the formation of a solar system. Dr. Evelyn Gates talked about the destruction in 50 or 80 billion years. How much of what we know now is really limited by the devices, the stages of computers and cameras, and how much would you expect to be in flux and changing as these become more developed? So the question is how much, how much is our picture of how the solar system formed, how much is that gonna be changing in the coming years as we learn more and more? And I would say it's changing fast as we speak. In fact, my third item that I'm about to talk about is gonna tell you to, to, that everything I've told you here, we may need to rethink. So we're getting more data. We are getting better computers to analyze that data and to simulate these processes. And some very interesting and different results are starting to come out. So, so hold on two minutes and we'll get to that. When we had this huge cloud of gas that was the beginning of the formation of our solar system, why wouldn't we expect a lot of homogeneity in the objects that form in the system, and yet we have these gas and um, massive gas planets and then the rocky planets? Right, so the question is, if the, if the composition of the, the nebula that formed the planets was very uniform, if everything was mixed together pretty well, why do we see such different planets? In the inner parts of the solar system, it was too hot to form the ices. And because the planets that could form were small and rocky, they didn't have enough gravity to sort of trap a lot of gas around them. The gas, you know, as far as it was concerned, it's hot, it doesn't care that there's a little planet there, it just does its thing. Whereas in the outer solar system, where there are ices, lots and lots of ices to form, not because there's different chemical compositions, but simply because the temperature was lower out there, so you could form lots of ice. In that region, because those icy bodies were much more massive, their gravity could trap a lot of gas around it. And so in the outer regions, that's why the big gaseous plants are there. So the difference isn't because there's different material in the nebula at different stages, but because of the temperature differences. That's the critical thing. The question really goes back to step one, but it's sort of reinforced by the following steps. And in step one, there was a picture of uh, one of the galaxies. And uh, at that time, I was thinking, I wonder how large that is. But now when you when we start talking about the the solar system and you know that that and the immense you know space that is around a particular star and then going back to the galaxy where we just had you know little dots every so often do we have any idea uh, i'm sure you have an idea as to what the span is of, of the galaxy that we had looked at uh, in terms of light years or whatever? The, the pictures that I showed you of, the, of those spiral galaxies at the, be, at the beginning of this last, or the end of the last section, those cover many thousands of light years. So the stars that you're seeing there, there are, there are millions and millions, there are even billions of stars just in that, in that one patch that I was showing. 
so when we, 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 when we change that scale to look at individual stars, we're changing scales by a factor of billions or more to go down and look at individual stars. Are the asteroids in the asteroid belt a function of a failed planet, or, or is it an indication that there was a, something there, that there was a collision? And on the other hand, is there any evidence that there's an accretion going on there that there would be another planet forming? So the question is the asteroid belt. This is the, the place in space between Mars and Jupiter where we see lots and lots of asteroids left over from the formation of the, of the solar system. And the question is why, right? Why, why are those asteroids, you know, if you look throughout the, the solar system, you do see asteroids throughout, but there's a big belt where there's lots and lots of asteroids right at that position. And so the question is why? And the answer is, it's not that there's something there that, that exploded or anything like that. It's in that region of space, those asteroids, just like the others, they were trying in the early part of the solar system, they were trying to clump up to make a planet. And, and left to their own devices, they would have. But they were very close to Jupiter. And again, Jupiter is a very massive planet. And every time they, those asteroids would start to clump together to try and form a planet, Jupiter's gravitational tug would sort of jiggle them around and disperse them again. And so they are at the exact spot in the solar system, we call it a resonance, where Jupiter's orbit, the way Jupiter's orbit works compared to the way their orbits work, is constantly sort of tweaking them apart. And so they never could form a planet. They wanted to, but they couldn't. You mentioned that what seemed to make a difference in the composition is the temperature um, at which, you know, the free zone and all that. Um, would there also be something to the effect of, you know, there's the overall gravity, everything's trying to get towards the center. You have the solar wind pushing everything out. Obviously, for the same surface area or the same amount of pressure, something that's made out of rock or iron is not gonna get stopped by the solar wind while helium or hydrogen would get blown out by the solar wind. So did the sun sort of sift everything out to, you know, when it got to the point where the solar wind balanced the gravitational forces, that's where these elements clumped, and then further in, as the heavier elements got clumped closer and closer to the sun? So the question is, how does the solar wind interact with sort of the, the, the structure of the disk, of the protostellar disk to, to change the planets? And it's, it's not so much the, the solar wind balancing the sun's gravitational force, but what happens is in the outer parts of the solar system, because Sun, you know, because the orbital time scales are very long, it takes much longer for Uranus or Neptune to go around the sun than Earth or Mars. It takes time for those very outer planets to accrete material, to, to sort of collect material and grow. And what happened to them is the solar wind sort of turned on before they could finish collecting material. So Jupiter and Saturn, a lot of gravity, things were happening faster, they grew very large. Uranus and Neptune were trying to do that but before they could finish that process, the solar wind kicked on and blew the gas out. And so it's, it's that interplay that really changes the, the, the way the planets form due to the solar wind kicking in. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Chris Mijos. Dr. Mijos is professor and chair of the astronomy department at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned how the planets of our solar system turned out so differently. In our final segment, Dr. Mijos will look at the surprising variety of planets around other stars and what they are teaching us about the formation of planets in general. Now, back to Dr. Mijos. Let me jump on to now tell you why everything I just told you may be an interesting story but not applicable across the, the galaxy. And the reason is, we're finding new worlds. We're finding new planetary systems, and they don't look like the one that we live in. And so this beautiful picture of how planets form, let me change that. It's how our planets form. It may not be how all planets form. So new worlds, exoplanets, what we mean by that is planets around other stars. The question is, first of all, how, how in the world do we find them? So let me describe two of the main techniques. There are a number of other ones as well, but let me describe two of the main ones. One is called Doppler wobble. So imagine, imagine the sun and Jupiter, pick one of our biggest planet, and the sun's gravity is holding Jupiter in its orbit. But one of the things that Isaac Newton taught us 
was equal and opposite reactions. That is, if the sun's gravity is holding Jupiter in an orbit, Jupiter's gravity must be holding the sun in an orbit. Not around Jupiter, but around the center of mass of the two systems. In other words, as Jupiter is doing this big orbit, the sun is doing a little teeny orbit. It's, it's not even really orbiting, it's just sort of wobbling. This is where in my, in my undergraduate class I do the hula. Right, the sun is doing this. So we can detect that because of the Doppler shift. Remember, things that move forward towards you, think of the train whistle analogy I used last time. You're standing on the tracks, the train's coming at you, the pitch of the train's whistle is higher as it comes at you and then drops as it goes beyond you. Right, it's changing the frequency of the sound. Same thing happens with the light from the star. During that part where it's hulaing towards you, it's Doppler shifting its light bluer, and as it's hulaing away, is that even a word, hulaing? As it's hulaing away, it's shifting to the red. And we can see that change in the spectrum of the star. So even though we don't see the other planet, we see the star wobbling around. And that wobble tells us that there's planets orbiting that star. So that's one of the ways that we do this. The other way we can do this is through eclipses. Imagine that here's my star and here's my planet and it's orbiting and if I catch it in the right orientation, if I'm orbiting like this, then every time I go around, it's gonna pass in front of the star and block a little bit of the light from the star. And so what I'm showing you on the bottom is imagine the planet moving in front of the star on those three different positions, and the plot is showing you the brightness of the star at each of those times. And so as the planet moves in front, the star actually dims a little bit. And you think, oh, that, that, that should be easy to see. Why did it take us so long to see it? The dimming we expect is less than a tenth of a percent of the light of the star. So it's a very small dimming of light. But the good thing is it's periodic, meaning it's gonna happen again. And so when we see it, we can say, well, okay, is it gonna happen again? Do we get a second occurrence and a third occurrence and a fourth occurrence? And if we do, then we know we've caught a planet. We can do this from ground-based telescopes. In fact, we at CASE, our, our telescope out at Kitt Peak, we've, we've found planets this way. What I'm showing you here is a satellite called the Kepler satellite, which was launched a few years ago and it's now the premier instrument for doing this. And it is finding thousands and thousands of what we call candidate exoplanets. We have to follow up with more observations before we can say for sure they're, they're exoplanets, but it's giving us lots of targets to look at. These are the two of the main ways that we find the planets. And what I wanna show you is how fast things are changing. This is a histogram of how many planets were discovered each year over roughly the past 20 years. You just think about, okay, what's it gonna look like over the next 20 years, 10 years, or even five years, right? We're finding hundreds and hundreds of planets. The Kepler satellite, it's been up and, and taking data for less than a year, and it's found thousands of possible candidates. So all of a sudden, we are finding lots of these things. Let me show one, it's a little bit complex, but it's worth, it's worth walking through. This is showing each year, the planets that we find, what is the mass of those planets? Right. And what I'm showing you here as a function, so early on, you can see the, the planet mass that, that's measured in, in not Earth masses, but Jupiter masses. So early on, most of the planets we were finding were Jupiter mass or bigger, okay? And the reason for that's pretty simple. A big planet is gonna have a big effect on its star. Right? It's either gonna make the star wobble harder or it's gonna block more of the light. And so early on we found these big giant Jupiter-sized things. It didn't mean that was all that were out there, it just meant that was what we could detect. But you can see as time is going by, we're finding more and more smaller things. And now, that blue line shows you the mass of the Earth. We are starting to find, through Kepler, we are starting to find planets that are very close to the mass of the Earth. Okay. So, the first question we were asking is, are there more planets out there? There are. 
are there planets Earth mass out there? We're starting to find those. The next interesting question is, do those planets live at a distance from their star where they could host life? That's sort of the next frontier. And I think we're going to be getting a lot of interesting information about those over the next few years. Let me just brag a bit. That one's our planet. That was a planet we discovered last year from the, the Burrell Schmidt telescope that we have out at Kitt Peak. What do you name it? Just... Sadly, we don't get to name our planets. That's up to the International Astronomical Union. So it, it actually doesn't even have a name yet. It just goes by a number that's so long I don't even remember what it is. But that's our planet. So just to give you an idea of the variety of planets that, that Kepler is finding, they run things like this up to 15, 16 times the size of the Earth. Here's Jupiter. It didn't discover Jupiter. That's just there for scale. But you can see it's running down in mass. Here's something that's about three times the, the size of the Earth down to Kepler 10b, one of the more recent discoveries. It's just a little bit bigger than the Earth. So we're getting down to discovering Earth mass planets around other stars. So this is how we find them. So what are we finding? Right? What, what, what lessons are we learning? The answer is we're finding things we never expected to find. We're finding these. These are called hot Jupiters. Imagine something, the mass of Jupiter, a giant gaseous planet but instead of out in the outer solar system, it's orbiting around its star so close that it takes only a few days to go around. Right? This is much closer than Mercury's orbit. This is, this is jammed right up against the star. And you think, wait, <laughs> he just told us to build planets that big, you had to be way in the outer solar system where it's cold enough to make those planets. And yet here's something closer than Mercury to its star and it's one of these giant gas planets. How in the world do we do that? The way we think something like this happens is the story that I told you about the solar wind blowing the gas out, imagine that didn't happen. Imagine you formed a planet in the middle of this big dense disk of material. The gravitational pull as it orbits around, it sort of creates a wake, like a boat wake in the disk and the gravitational interaction between that planet and that wake can cause the planet to spiral inwards. So we call this planetary migration. We don't think it formed there. We don't think it could form there. It had to have formed in the outskirts, but it spiraled inwards. Planets like this don't have long to live. What else are we finding? Finding strange orbits. This is just a sketch. The yellow circles show you the planets in our own solar system, their orbits. And you can see they're pretty circular. Our, our Earth has a, has a nice circular orbit. That's good, right? If we had a very strange orbit, just imagine the seasons, right? So it's good that we have a circular orbit. The red show four planets, not all around the same star, but this is their orbit around their star. And you can see the diversity, right? You do see one that has a nice circular orbit here, uh, just sort of like Earth's orbit. But there are other ones where the orbits are very elongated. Another one there, another one there. How do you do that? I mean, what we had was that we formed planets out of a disk of material which was simply rotating. And so you'd imagine the planets that would condense out and form would also have those nice circular orbits. What we think happened here was that these are uh, uh, systems where you may have multiple planets forming, multiple massive planets forming. And just like I said where Jupiter and Saturn took a slingshot and threw the, the comets out into the Oort cloud, we think that they can't throw the other planets out that far, but they can tweak their orbits. So instead of moving on nice circles, they get perturbed onto these long, elongated orbits. Right? This certainly didn't happen in our solar system, but it happened in these. And then, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like everything that Kepler discovers is a, is, a new, is a new feature to us. Here's something called Kepler 11. 
this is a system of, of six planets. Okay, that sounds like ours. Six planets, but they orbit their star all within the orbit of Mercury around our sun. And so you have, just think of taking our entire solar system and collapsing it down to this tiny miniature solar system. It's miniature in extent, but the planets, some of the planets are as big as Neptune. Very different from our solar system. And then there's this one, Trust 2b. This is a planet where if you, it was originally discovered through ground-based observations, but because of the accuracy of the Kepler satellite, being able to detect minor, very tiny changes in the brightness of the star, it noticed that as the planet went around the star, it didn't see any change in brightness except when the planet moved in front. And so what that means is, if it's not seeing any change in brightness when the planet went around behind, that planet is not reflecting any light. That planet is almost perfectly black. So for example, we think it's a gas giant, and something like Jupiter, Jupiter reflects 40% of the light that it, it strikes it. That's why we can see it. We're seeing reflected sunlight. This planet reflects only 1% of the light. It's essentially a black planet. Why is that? We don't know. Must be something about the chemical composition of the atmosphere, but what that is is unclear. We don't see anything like that in our solar system. And then one of my favorites, this one just came out, you might have seen this in the news a few months ago, Kepler 16b, this is a planet that orbits not one star, but two. This is a binary star system. And this planet orbits around the two of them. So if you remember Star Wars, the scene on Tatooine, when the double star system rises, there it is. You know, science fiction, we, it took science a little while to catch up, but we got there. These, these, I mean, people are working out how you could have a stable orbit around a binary star. There's still a lot of work to be done on, on understanding how these systems form. So what does it all mean? It means we understand to a great extent how our solar system formed. We've worked on it for years and years. We understand the theory. We've got good observations that connect everything together. We think we understand how planets form. And then we look at other systems and they don't look like ours. And it tells us we really have a lot to learn. So this goes back to your question about how fast are things going to change? It's not how fast are things going to change, it's how fast are things changing now. We are, we are rethinking a lot of the, a lot of, it's the old Yogi Berra, right? It's not the things that you know for sure, it's, it's not the things that you don't know that you worry about, it's the things that you know for sure that just ain't so. That's what we're finding. Thanks. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.